extension assembly. The extension assembly is the uh, network of Sea Grant extension directors for the 33 programs. And that group is headed up by Dave Hansen, who's on the call. Dave, thank you for your leadership. Uh, in, in late April, on one call that he uh, led, we decided we wanted to do a survey of our leadership and ask what are the challenges that are central to Sea Grant extension and Sea Grant programming during this COVID era that we were thrust into. Um, and the, the survey had two parts. One was to look at internal challenges. And we had a seminar a couple weeks ago on some of those regarding staff management, personal wellness. But we also really wanted to know what our external programming challenges and interest would be in this post or COVID era. And there were a number of things that the uh, directors could choose from and direct marketing of seafood emerged as the number one category under strong interest. Uh, there were certainly other topics and those will be the focus of other seminars, but today we're gonna focus on direct marketing and we have four panelists today and they're going to provide some uh, fodder for our discussion after they finish talking. We'll have the Q&A section open up in the chat for you to ask questions and I'll try to moderate that. The focus of this is Sea Grant programs and, and how they have and can get involved in this and what some of the opportunities and challenges are. Each panelist has been given seven minutes to start and they have a set of three questions that they'll try to address before we get into our exchange. And those questions are, first, how and why did you get into direct marketing? And then the second question is, what successes and challenges and lessons have you learned from your experience in direct marketing? And perhaps most importantly, number three, how has COVID-19 changed your situation as it relates to direct marketing? On our panel today, we have two from the private sector and two from Sea Grant. And I will introduce those collectively and then one-on-one -on -one as we shift to speakers. The first is Amber Mae Peterson, uh, works for the Fishmonger's Wife Seafood Market in Norton Shores, Michigan. She will be followed by Matt Brown, founder and director of sales for Sopo Seafood in South Portland, Maine. We'll go from there to Carrie Culver, uh, a marine extension agent with California Sea Grant in the Santa Barbara Channel region. And then we'll wrap up with Thomas E. Mel, Marine Extension, Louisiana Sea Grant, working in Iberia, St. Martin, Lafayette, Vermilion, St. Landry of all parishes and statewide in his initiatives. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Amber to uh, kick us off and I will mute my mic and ask her to unmute hers. Thank you, Amber. We appreciate you being here. Thank you so much, Rex. Thank you for the invitation too. What an honor. So um, my name is Amber Mae Peterson. Everyone can hear me first, right? Okay, good. Um, I am the owner and operator of the Fishmonger's Wife. We are a fresh and smoked fish market in Norton Shores, which is a suburb area of Muskegon, Michigan. Um, and how I got into direct marketing was as I got married. <laughs> so um, my husband is a fourth generation commercial fisherman on Lake Michigan. Uh, and his family's been here, we're approaching uh, 90 years this year, I think it is, or 95. So since 1927, you guys can do the math. Um, and anyways, though, his family has actually never done any direct sales. They've 100% been wholesalers, uh, shipping their catch to larger processors, either in Michigan or into New York or Chicago. And 10 years ago, after we had our first daughter, um, we were, I was looking for something that would let me stay at home. So I decided to open my own business. Um, <laughs> maybe I didn't think that through too well. Um, but here in Muskegon, we have the second largest farmer's market in the state. So I started out by just going to the farmer's market with fresh fish to see how it would go. Um, and we just, we took off. Um, Muskegon was hungry for fresh fish, locally caught. Um, that was in 2010, which is, of course, when the local food movement was really in its peak. And, you know, we were starting to see farmer's markets boom and things like that. So uh, we did really well. And then two years later, we bought a brick and mortar building and we continued with our um, just growing, expanding the direct sales. Um, so the reason why we did it though was because the money, I'm gonna be honest, the wholesale market is where you move volume of course, but when you're at the end of the month and you're looking to bring that little extra home, the retail sales is what makes up 
that difference. Uh, and so that's why we did it. Uh, and, and so far it's paid off. It's been really great to us <clears throat> for sure. So, and I got to watch my time. I'm a talker. So, <laughs> uh, so some of the successes and challenges we've had though, um, you know, I had some advice in 2011, which was Facebook really wasn't where you could make sales. Um, <laughs> and I kind of, I took that to heart for like two years and uh, come to find out that wasn't the truth. Like I do a lot of business and promotion on Facebook um, and a lot of awareness. And, and so I think the biggest lesson I learned from that was, is just because it's not right for somebody else's business doesn't mean that it's not great for your business. Um, so always, you know, take a look at your business to see what it needs and where it can flourish. Uh, the other thing is a quote that my brother told me, and he said, Amber, if you want it done right, get over yourself and hire it out. <laughs> and so the, the truth is there are some things that, you know, when you're a small business, you, you try to do everything because you want to do it cheaply, basically, and you're trying to save money when in reality, you just need to hire that out. And the example I use is our web page. Um, yes, I could design the web page and I could lay it out and it would take a lot of time and it would be take three times the amount of time that someone who just does it did it. Uh, same thing when we went to online sales. Um, I could have done it except for hiring it out was so much more efficient and you know just telling someone else and be able to communicate what my dream was to them and letting them do it. Um, that was really you know an important thing. So. Once again, that know what your strengths and your weaknesses are, for sure. And then um, put the right people in the right places has been our number one thing that we've learned in the last 10 years. Um, I'm the face of the company. I'm the chatterbox. I can spend all day in front of people shaking their hands, telling them how to cook fish, tell them about my husband, tell them about the great things and uh, all these things. And um, you can ask me to go in the back and cut fish and I'm dying after half an hour. Like I just want out of there. It's not that I can't do it. I just don't want to. And versus my husband, he's the exact opposite. Um, he can check a customer out and we get that person's money and that's about it. <laughs> so acknowledging, you know, where your strengths and your weaknesses are, um, you know, and same thing when you hire people, when I started hiring people, it was really important to identify, you know, who could do what. And I found that working in the processing room is a different personality type than working retail sales up front. So, um, and then that last thing, COVID, how has COVID changed? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not even going to talk about the operational things, but your direct marketing, I have found that we are booming right now, um, especially during the peak um, of the panic when everybody, when we were seeing no chicken in the stores and, we, you know, there was headlines about we're not going to have meat and things like that. Um, you know, we were, we were busier than we could handle for sure, because people just wanted to know where their food was coming from. They liked seeing that the person that caught it and the person that was processing it were healthy, basically, I think. Um, and we had done a really good job for the last 10 years about having a good community relationship. So people knew that when they were coming to us, if we were sick, like if someone in the building had been sick, we were going to tell people and say, hey, we're shut down because we have COVID here. Uh, and so building that community trust was really, really huge. Um, and so during, like I said, that we had that six week period here in Michigan where, um, you know, everybody was just incredibly worried and didn't know what to do. Um, we saw people every Friday, like they had their pre order, they had standing orders with us. They came no matter what, um, same with Saturdays and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Like we just heard lots of thank yous and that's continued now on into, um, the summer months, we are no longer a stay at home here in Michigan. Um, and we're reopening in phases, but we still are seeing those same people who are coming and they're saying, and they're just thanking us and saying, thank you for being open. We really appreciate that. Um, so it, I think that direct sales, um, connection that you get with people right now is really going to show, 
um, it's important because I've felt for the last couple of years that the farmer's market local food movement has plateaued. Um, but I think that we're going to see this bring on another resurgence of it. So, so all right. I'm, yeah, just curious. I'm sure I'm not the only one, but quickly, what species, yeah. what, what products are you in your part of the country? Oh, yeah. yes. I'm sorry. That's okay. It wasn't <laughs> one of the questions, but I'm just wondering. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, here in the state of Michigan, we are licensed through the state. Uh, whitefish makes up, Great Lakes whitefish makes up 99% of what we catch. Yes. Um, I do work with tribal fishermen for lake trout, and then we run 200% wood-fired smokehouses. Awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Yeah. I want to say thank you again, and we're going to yeah. continue to move on. Um, we're keeping this very casual. Uh, we have 85 people, but most of them are Sea Grant people, and they're casual by nature. So, um, Matt, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Matt Brown, founder and director of Sopo Seafood, if I'm saying that right, in South Portland, Maine. So I will uh, mute and say uh, stay tuned, Amber, because we're going to have Q&A after we finish our speaker panel. All right. Matt, take it away. All right. Thanks, Rex. Yeah, Matt, uh, with Sopo Seafood, uh, Sopo was started in January, and our intention was to sell to restaurants. And uh, so I could answer the last question by answering the first question. We just started direct marketing, not a necessity, uh, when the restaurants closed. <clears throat> Excuse me. When the restaurants basically closed, uh, we did nothing for a couple weeks, and then we said, hey, why don't we try some home deliveries here? And uh, when we did, uh, it was met with a good response. We, um, you know, decided to do the best quality we could. Uh, a lot of local stuff, haddock, scallops. Uh, we were working with some local fishermen, and we had some good stories to tell. And um, we get out there and told the stories and delivered super high-quality seafood that um, – people really seem to appreciate. Uh, like Amber said, we did get a lot of thank yous, a lot of appreciation, uh, which made it feel good. It made it feel like we were doing something good in the community. Uh, you know, some older folks that didn't want to get out of the house and uh, some other people that just really enjoyed uh, getting, you know, restaurant quality seafood delivered to their door. Uh, you know, kind of take fresh seafood for granted here in Maine, but, uh, you know, most of the fresher, better stuff goes to restaurants and a lot of retail customers aren't, aren't used to seeing that level of quality that uh, that we've been doing, and that's that's helped build our uh, core brand and, and our values, and uh, it's really helped us launch launch a business. And uh, you know, we've only been doing deliveries for a few short weeks here, um, but we've been met with success. A lot of that's like uh, Amber said on Facebook. Uh, everyone's on Facebook nowadays, uh, especially during the pandemic. They're spending more time on it. And uh, they're seeing, you know, we're, we have a good network of friends. Uh, you know, I've been in Maine for 43 years and, you know, a lot of people uh, that have tried it, then you see their friends try it. And um, I guess that's kind of how social media works, right? So, um, you know, we started with uh, a little order form, uh, kind of like a Google Doc uh, that people would have to fill out and send back. And we had a lot of, a lot of emails going back and forth, a lot of questions. Uh, but that's how we launched. We just were dealing with it. Uh, we moved over to a better website. Uh, luckily, my, one of my partners is uh, really good at that. He's actually built the website from scratch and maintains it daily. Um, so I guess we're fortunate in that perspective. Matt, what, what products do you guys specialize in? So we, we try to do uh, pretty much anything that's from Maine. Uh, you know, like I said, a lot of haddock scallops. Um, we did we just ran a lot of halibut for the last few weeks. We'll be doing bluefin tuna when that pops up soon. Uh, we've got uh, crab meat. We work with a, we, uh, a smoke producer up in uh, Winter Harbor, Grindstone Necks. We sell their smoke products. Uh, we work with local oyster farmers. Um, Atlantic Sea Farms, they do some value-add seaweed products that we carry. So pretty much anything that we can get our hands on in Maine that we feel is, is worth, you know, telling the story. I think you're on mute, Rex. Sorry about that. Thank you, Matt. We're going to um, – we're going to move on, but I've been asked through the chat to uh, remind everybody to mute your mics if you're not speaking. Um, so I'll do that um, and stick around. We're going to 
We're going to open this up to Q&A uh, after we finish our next few speakers. The next one is Carrie Culver, Marine Extension, California Sea Grant, Santa Barbara Channel Region. So, Carrie, you're up. Great. Thanks, Rick. Um, yeah, so I got involved with direct marketing because of the challenges that the fishing community was facing when I was shortly after I started um, doing my extension work. And there had been some major downsizing of fisheries in California that were causing um, challenges in terms of the economic viability of fishing businesses. So costs were going up, but there were a lot more restrictions on the amount of catch that could come in. And so there was a lot of concern and just trying to understand how can we make more money on, you know, a smaller amount of catch. And so direct marketing seemed like it might be an option. Um, on top of that, there was also, it was also during a time when there was increased attention, negative attention on fisheries. So recognizing there was a lot of misperceptions and just a basic lack of knowledge about local fisheries. Um, again, direct marketing surfaced. It was one way that people could start connecting with the community, educating them. And so it was kind of an interesting divergence because all of that was happening and there were these challenges, but then there was an opportunity because of the local food movement and slow food movement. So initially I would say there definitely was interest in making more money, but in some ways the connection with the community was driving why um, direct marketing was of interest. So the first, um, we had already had some dockside markets in our area. And so one thing that we kept hearing about with the um, ag advisors, so this was at a time where California Sea Grant advisors were in the same offices with the Cooperative Extension um, Farm Advisors. And so I heard a lot of them talking about all these different types of direct marketing. It was a great way to learn and, and throw ideas around, but we decided, well, what about trying some of these CSAs, but with seafood? So this was, this was almost 10 years ago now, um, but we did, uh, instead of just jumping in and trying to do it, we did do a feasibility study to understand what products the fishermen had available, how much of those products, and then also on the consumer side, what were people willing to accept? Um, you know, what would they handle? What would they eat? All those kinds of things. And we even have an, had an event where fishermen and customers came together. They learned about the seafood. You know, they learned some of the handling techniques and of course enjoyed it. Everybody got to enjoy it together, which I think was helpful too. That um, feasibility study eventually did turn into a business that is booming now. As you've heard, COVID actually has helped with some of these um, direct marketing efforts. So it's been a definite success story. The other um, way I got involved with direct marketing was there were a few years ago, again, wow, it's been more than a few, <laughs> but there was some social science um, funding available. And so I was able to work with my colleague, Carrie Pomeroy, on a Market Your Catch website um, that came out of a research study that she led where we actually interviewed, um, I should say she interviewed, I got to tag along and listen and learn, <laughs> um, more than, I think it was 98 people from the West Coast and the East Coast, mainly North and South Carolina, and then on the West Coast, California and Washington. Um, but there were more than 150 individuals that were providing a lot of information about their experiences with direct marketing. And we were able to, try to synthesize that information into this website called Market Your Catch. And on that website, there's three parts. The first one is, is it for you? So one of the lessons learned is it isn't for everybody. It, it, you know, it takes some different skills and different personalities. Um, so it is important to think about it and consider whether it's for you or not. And then the other thing is there's a lot of different types of markets. So you hear about direct marketing and often people think of off the boat sales or these farmers or fishermen's markets as we call them here, the Saturday markets often. Um, but there's other types that aren't quite as direct like institutional sales. You might sell to say like your Google or IBM cafeteria or a hospital. Um, you know, they're not quite direct but they're a little more direct. Uh, and so there are some different types that we put on the website so people could understand and think about 
how some of them may fit better with their business and, and, and their goal for their business. And then how to get started and expand. Um, there's definitely lots of, lots of things to learn. And again, I, I was learning from all these folks that actually have done it, like Amber and Matt. <laughs> Um, and so we were able to put this information out on this website. The website, although it's uh, based on or focused on West Coast fisheries, it's definitely applicable more broadly. Again, we did collect information from the East Coast. Um, we talked to aquaculturists, a few aquaculturists, as well as fishermen and buyers and handlers, distributors. Um, so that information is actually on the website. There's a lot about tips and lessons learned, things to consider for the different types of markets. And also just in terms of getting started, um, permitting of course is one of those <laughs> that can be really difficult to come over. And I'll get to that in a, in a minute again here. The other thing I want to mention was we just uh, put out a, or we were just able to publish a paper through FAO and it actually gives some history and highlights all the efforts on within direct marketing for Alaska and California Sea Grant Extension. So it has some different um, projects that have gone on in both states. Alaska, of course, has been involved in direct marketing for quite a long time. We learned a lot from them um, while doing this. And the uh, Market Your Catch website really uses a lot of their direct marketing manual for fishermen. Um, he uses information from that manual. So it was a great collaboration amongst many Sea Grant programs. And hopefully, again, it's useful more broadly, um, not just for, for fishermen in California or the West Coast even. So in terms of the successes and challenges, uh, we definitely uh, highlight those on the website and that's probably the best way to go. You heard some great things from Amber and Matt. Those are things that resonated with what things with things that I was hearing uh, when we were also talking with folks. They're, it's really important to deal with the regulations. They're really difficult. It's something we, even with the agencies, we had some issues because not everybody knows how to deal with seafood, so they weren't quite sure how, where it fit in. Um, so that's a lesson learned on the extension side is there's still a need to educate the permitting agencies, so a lot of the public health agencies. It's not just federal and state, but there's also local level, right? The county and even some cities. And then in terms of COVID, um, what initially was or still is a dire situation for many, we've heard stories as you just heard that it actually has um, increased sales for some seafood. It's not again for everybody, um, but we've seen a lot more interest in doing it. So there's been a lot more people asking, how do we get started? How do we do this? And we can point to the website, but there's, it's not quite clear what's needed. Is it just people need some training? Do they need, you know, connections with people? Do they need additional infrastructure um, to support their direct marketing? Or do they need new products? So for instance, not all people want to deal with live seafood, which is a big product. Most of our products here in Santa Barbara are live product and not all households want to get that live product um, on their doorstep. <laughs> so there's uh, some other questions that we're just trying to understand better what the needs are now. Gary, do you have the website that you can rattle off right off hand or maybe have somebody submit it in the chat because we're getting questions about the URL address for that. Yeah, it's um, Market Your Catch. Oh, there it is. Donald Schreiner. Oh, <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> All right. Well, there you go. Ask and you shall receive. All right. Um, and I've asked everyone else, but tell us about some of the species that are more prominent in direct marketing for California's a big area, obviously, but yeah, it's, it does differ on, for different areas. I'm in the tr what we call a transition, transition zone, easy for me to say. <laughs> um, so we get both southern and northern species, both warm and cold water species. So there's a great diversity of species and it, it obviously changes as you go north and south. But for us, um, we have a lot more invertebrates. So that's been one of the challenges with drug marketing is are the products something people want, sea urchins, sea cucumbers, things like that. <laughs> versus, of course, we have lobster and, and several species of crab, shrimp, um, fin fish, we have sea bass, rockfish, halibut. Those are probably some of the top ones. Thank you. 
Very interesting and stick around. We got one more panelist and we'll open it up. I see a lot of good webinar chat questions. So we'll have a rapid fire Q and A after this, but thank you very much, Carrie. Tom, um, if you'll queue up, I'll turn the mic over to you. Okay, I'm ready. Can you hear me? Yeah, go right ahead. Okay, thank you everybody. I'm Thomas Email. I'm in, down in the central part of coastal Louisiana, south central, uh, they call it the Acadiana Bay region. This is, if you ever watch uh, Swamp People on television, those guys are real and they're from my area. So anyway, glad to chat a bit. Uh, we've been engaged in direct marketing now for about a decade. <laughs> Doesn't seem that long, but it's, uh, it's been a nice, exciting run. Started over 10 years ago with the, uh, our port here, shrimp port here, historic port, the Port of Delcom, spelled D-E-L-C-A-M-B-R-E. -E. So we work with the Port of Delcom and the shrimp fleet there. And uh, what had happened to get us uh, going in direct marketing is that we'd been devastated by hurricanes and the downward price on shrimp from import. So our, our, our fleet was, our, especially our small boat fleet was just dying. And uh, it was a bunch of rust buckets in town here. And so you might imagine though, that, well, so you know, we, we catch about a hundred million pounds of shrimp here every year. That's our big uh, shrimp, crabs and oysters. Those are our big species. And Louisiana has several thousand commercial shrimpers. So uh, direct marketing has always been something that's been going on uh, over the years, but uh, as people moved away from the coast and, and uh, new people moved in, they didn't have those traditional links to commercial fishermen. So we wanted to, to recreate that. Uh, also looking at the farm to table trend that uh, we knew people around were looking for local products. And so we decided to initiate a formal program, marketing program through the port. And it was very important for, as you'll learn all the things that uh, by having this relationship with the port, it really made everything happen and it grew statewide. So. We created the uh, Delcom Direct Seafood Program with port funds initially and lots of effort. Uh, we had a steering committee in the community to reimagine the working waterfront, revitalize the, the local fleet of about 30 uh, shrimp vessels, lots and lots of work and time and meetings, even required ordinances to be changed to allow for direct sales across the public docks. A website was created called Delcom Direct Seafood which allowed for the posting of fresh cash messages. And so that was like a blog. And so imagine a shrimp boat coming in uh, with 2,000 pounds of 2125s call for prices. So fishermen set their own prices. No prices are posted on websites or social media, uh, which is really essential in our world here with so many people selling product. It avoids, a, uh, if you don't post and you make them call, you it avoids a race to the bottom among competitors. So the, the port promoted and marketed this via our website, via the website that was created in social media. There was lots of media attention because it was the university, it was the port, and, and seafood really is uh, the heart and soul of the coastal area. And so people, uh, so the, the news people and the writers and all really like to write stories about this. And there were lots and lots of interest from the public to buy direct off the boat. It started with one boat, Jimmy Dupree on the T-Turbo and the rest is history. So uh, there were detractors, other shrimp businesses felt threatened. There was a lot of pushback locally and even statewide from some powerful industry players that we had to deal with. Took a lot of spears and arrows and, and we still get them. Uh, but uh, this is, you have to understand that this has been, had been traditionally and still is for the most part a commodity industry where shrimp are sold to the dock, the dock sold to the processors. But the Delcom Steering Committee and the port said that if the shrimpers there cannot survive economically, then the industry would die. So this program was put together to really save that working waterfront and those key players there, the local fishermen. And even many, even today, 10 years later, there's uh, many of the same boats are still active in the program. So the Delcom program, Delcom Direct program was a great success. So folks now know when a boat is coming in and they're lined up at the dock when the boat arrives. Uh, shrimpers can sell from the public docks now seven days a week when the inshore seasons are open. What we do is connect people with people uh, through, uh, through the website and through social media, through the, uh, 
through all of that. And it's amazing when you go there and, and it happens when a boat pulls in, here are the cars lined up, the ice chest, and people are, they buy them all. We can't, we can't produce enough shrimp locally to meet the needs. Uh, and so everything that's caught by these boats, shrimp, crabs, fish, and all is sold. And the prices are often double what the docks are paying. It's a great deal for the customer, great for the shrimper, and that's uh, delcomdirectseafood.com. You'll see that. So uh, this success was really due to the great champions of the port director, Wendell Verrett, and the public dock facility that we had there. And this led, just led on to other projects. So we started, uh, we being uh, the port and the community, started a monthly seafood farmer's market there, which brought tourism and visitors to the community. And there's now a first of the month uh, seafood farmer's market, the Delcom Seafood Farmer's Market. About a thousand people come to that. In addition to those that come during the week to buy seafood off the boats, uh, we were able to receive some hurricane recovery funds that built a new dock, a pavilion, a boat launch, a marketing facility, a $6 million project from a hurricane recovery money. So the facility there is named Bayou Carlin Cove. It's the home of Delcom Direct Seafood and Farmers Market, which has just become an entity of its own. It's listed by the Southern Living as one of the top farmers markets in the South. Uh, also funding from uh, Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission allowed the Delcom project to expand statewide. It created then the, the from the Delcom Direct seafood program created the Louisiana Direct Seafood Program, which created uh, four projects ac across the coast from the west, from the Texas line, the Cameron Direct, then the Delcom Direct, which was the original, then uh, La Terre Direct, which is Lafouche and Terrebonne parishes, and then South Shore Direct around the New Orleans region. And so that's uh, all under the Louisiana Direct Seafood umbrella. I got just a few more uh, comments. So at the same time, so that's all under Louisiana Direct Seafood, uh, com. At the same time, we had fishermen who wanted to process, pack, and freeze their own seafood to be able to inventory and sell value added during the off season. So our Sea Grant team assisted with this development, uh, provided technical assistance. We called the effort Beyond the Boat. All these small processors required a, a Department of Health certification, HACCP, and all the regulatory requirements. And these packs are all frozen, vacuum packed, high gourmet, gourmet quality, demanding top play, uh, price in the marketplace. Uh, we helped develop uh, local brands to sell them under called Vermilion Bay uh, Sweet uh, is one, one brand uh, named after a bay here. Also, we have a Louisiana Direct Seafood and Brand, and packed under those include shrimp, oysters, crab meat, black drum, grouper, tuna, snapper, soft shell crabs, on and on. So the program is like a seafood uh, incubator. We started with direct marketing, but it's gone on to value added. So, uh, so with all these value added packages, we then created an e-commerce project to help get the products some visibility and sales across the country. And this is all managed by the Port of Delcom. We launched this in March of this year under the Delcom Direct Seafood Shop. And uh, the seafood shop really came alive, alive with COVID when both the governor and the lieutenant governor of Louisiana announced these programs, our Louisiana Direct Seafood and Louisiana Direct Seafood Shop, when the governors announced those in their news conferences encouraging people to eat local seafood. So could talk a, long, a lot more about this, but requires vision, partnership, funding, and in the end, this is about innovation uh, and uh, connecting people with people and allowing commerce to happen. So that's, that's the nuts and bolts of it. Tom, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Um, and I wanna say thanks again to our panelists and to everyone. We now have 84 people online. And uh, what we'll do is I'll start uh, by asking some questions in the order that they appeared in the chat. If you have a question uh, at the bottom of your screen, if you hover your mouse, you'll see a little chat symbol there where you can type in a question. And some of these will be directed to individuals and some will be to the panel at large. Uh, the first ones are to Matt and to Amber. I think they're looking from the commercials perspective. Um, 
One was to Matt. Matt, how much in advance uh, does someone need to put an order in with your company uh, for you to deliver product? And then I think uh, there were some questions to Matt and Amber, both about do you ship? Are there other forms of distribution? So I will ask Matt and Amber to respond to that. So we we ship, uh, we do curbside pickups on Wednesdays and Saturdays. We do home delivery on Thursday and Friday. We take orders up until the night before. It's any time up till midnight for the next day. We also do ship UPS anywhere in the country. Amber, thank you, Matt. You want to weigh in on that one? Sure. Um, generally, we accept orders up until 3 p.m. the day before delivery. We have a couple of different farmer's markets um, that we go to. If you are coming into the store to pick up, you can pick up in, within usually half an hour. It depends on how busy we are. So, um, and, and to be honest, if you call the morning of a farmer's market and we have time, I mean, we're going to sell you fish. So what we try to do, give, give yourself as much time as you need to get all of your orders packed um, is what I say. And then if you want to take some last minute Lucy's, that's fine. But always imagine how big your order can be and don't cut your short self, yourself short on time. That's a really bad situation. That's Been there a couple of times. So Amber, <laughs> while, while I have you up, you, you actually yeah. started to answer one of the questions that I, I'm going a little bit out of order, but I think since you're on, I'll ask you, it had to do with your comment about knowing your strengths and knowing your weaknesses. And I think that's an excellent point in anything that you pursued, but certainly direct marketing. The question was, do you pay someone to develop ads for you? And you had talked about that on the website. Uh, so for you and Matt and, and maybe the other panelists to the extent they want to speak for commercial cooperators, uh, do you find that social media or Facebook is sufficient or do you need to have uh, somebody who can run that for you? So my strength is marketing. Um, that is my jam. I love the layout. I love the design. I love laying out my month long calendar of what our take and bake meals are going to be, what our weekly special is going to be having. I love doing the emails, the blog posts, all of that is stuff that I love to do. So the only thing I generally pay for is, for example, if we're going to a new location for a farmer's market, I'll pay Facebook to drop my ad in someone else's newsfeed to generate awareness for us. Okay. Um, we used to do like billboards. I've done billboards before. Um, I've worked with our local newspaper for things like that. I have never been incredibly happy with that. I've always found when I've done it myself, we've had a better response. I think though that that is because I have a very strong, clear voice and I connect with my customer base and I have the ability to do that versus when you go with a bigger company, it tends to be a little bit more generic. Gotcha. If your strength is not communicating, don't put yourself in the position to do that. My husband would not be a good communications director for us. He would be better just to write a check to Lamar Billboard boards. Gotcha. So once again, know yourself. Thank you. Excellent response. Matt, you care to weigh in on how you handle advertising for the services you provide and make sure you unmute. There you go. Yeah, we've, um, we've been approached with some opportunities that we've had to decline because we've just, we've been so busy. Uh, basically I'm doing all the purchasing and, and packaging and most of delivery. So but we can only do as much business as I can, as, as I can touch. And, um, so we, we do social media, we do an email, um, but we've, we've turned down opportunities for advertising to date. Uh, we are looking to hire, we are looking for a bigger space, uh, hopefully a retail store and a larger wholesale operation. So, you know, I, I think we'll be going down that path, you know, some point down the road. Um, so while I have you on the phone, um, have you thought about getting involved? And this is a question to all the panelists that showed up with some of these uh, new wave meal packaging programs. Um, I think that would require probably some additional value added processing, I'm assuming, but Blue, Blue Apron was mentioned as an example. There's a lot of direct meal shipping going on. Has that come up for you, Matt, Amber, Carrie, Tom, um, at all? In this it's, it's cut. Go ahead. I mean, it, it's come up. People have offered, and, and we've thought of it. You know, like even even like kind of like the Fish Club or 
you know, different, like you said, value add stuff. And we're just trying to stay focused on our product right now, be more of like a fish market on wheels and, and not be, not trying to confuse that with, you know, grocery stores and other stuff. So we're just trying to stick to, uh, you know, raw ingredients at this point. Excellent. Anyone else want to weigh in on that one from our panel? I mean, honestly, we have had the same thing where we've been approached by people and it always comes back at the end of the day to the fact that we still move more products through at full retail price through our market. And that's our end game. Really, it is. Um, is so when someone wants to buy wholesale pricing from us and we'd be cutting into our retail sales to provide that product, uh, you know, we, we make a pass on that. So not everybody's in that situation. That's just the situation we're in. So. But I do know that the next wave we're going to see, I think that Blue Apron and those meal service um, delivery services, this has been the kick for them to really put them into the marketplace before there's always been a lot of flirting around with them. People try it. It's inconsistent. I think this is going to be what makes or breaks that industry. That's, that's an excellent point. Um, anyone else um, on the... Uh, the sort of pre-package and value-added aspects before we go to our next question. By the way, there are plenty of questions here. Uh, I, I did, Rex, I'd like, I would like to say that in, in direct marketing, which is the reason that we went to these value-added packaging that are now for sale on the seafood shop is that not everybody wants to mess with shrimp and de-head shrimp. They buy a nice chest full of this or that. A lot of people prefer to get something that's re freezer ready that they can store and use at will. And so that is that has driven uh, has driven the development of these products, and really it's catching on very nicely. So while I've got you on the on the screen here, Tom, there was a question directed to you, Mr. Email. How do you defend against price gouging or unfair pricing practices if no prices are listed on the web on the website? Well, they're listed on the on the seafood shop, but when you're talking about direct marketing off of the boat. People here who buy off the boat who are going to do that are very savvy on price. So there's no way you're going to drop, uh, you're, going to, you're going to get an exorbitant uh, price for some fresh shrimp here in South Louisiana. Everybody knows what, they, what to expect to pay for it. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, what about, uh, and again, Tom or anyone on the call, uh, branding. Do you find whether you're doing this as a commercial entity or you're doing this as an extension uh, advisor for Sea Grant that branding is important, or is it just the the matchmaker role for extension, perhaps? Um, uh, and and let me let me ask that again of of, of our two private sector consult uh, panelists as well. Uh, branding identity, how important that is? Uh, so important. I uh, I cannot. Accept to you how important it is to protect your brand and to have a brand that is you. Um, my company's name is The Fishmonger's Wife. I have landed on the front page of the newspaper in Michigan a couple of times and I've had the editors tell me, well, it's only because you're called The Fishmonger's Wife. And in the United States, we can't put Fishmonger's Wife on the paper a whole lot. So your name gets you there, okay? And it's something that people remember, you know, but your branding is everything. Like, and I think Matt made a really, really smart comment when he said, we've had opportunities for more advertising, but we're so busy already. We're not taking on more work. That's part of your brand. Don't take on more than what you can quality assure. I mean, you're just going to lose that high end customer base that you're building because ultimately direct sales, you know, people come to you expecting something better than what they're getting in the grocery store already. And so protecting your image and your brand and having a really clear idea of what your brand is, is very, very, very important, at least in my perspective. Excellent. Thank you, Matt. Anything to add to that? Uh, no, I mean, I agree with what Amber says. We, you know, early on, we started doing these deliveries. Uh, you know, we started really making our name for ourselves in the local community. And, you know, we were surprised. We thought we were going to be doing, dealing with restaurants. And, um, you know, the way we looked at this home delivery was, you know, the response we had. We have like 45 Facebook reviews. Uh, we haven't even been doing deliveries for 45 days. And super positive, just, just a, lot of, uh, a lot of love coming from the community. So 
we've ended up building our brand and our company uh, image through these retail deliveries, which we just never thought would happen. Um, but yeah, it's all about quality and, um, you know, making sure that we've uh, earning people's trust and keeping that trust. Excellent. Excellent. Well, uh, the next question, and I'm going to ask Carrie to come forward first on this one, if she's got her mic ready. Um, and this is Jermaine Dahl of our panelists, really. How have you all addressed issues associated with food safety? And Carrie, uh, you have a pretty impressive uh, list of things you've done there in California. I think you touched on this a little bit. I know we have in Louisiana, but Carrie uh, Culver, if you'll weigh in and then we'll hear from the others. Go ahead. Sure, so this is, I'm sorry, the question was about the seafood quality and how do you- well, seafood it? safety, really. Seafood the question safety. was, when you're doing direct marketing, because you know, you're, I would assume you're a smaller organization, you don't have the food security arm of your corporation handling that. Uh, how do you advise people getting into this um, to be in compliance and to provide good quality information on safety. Yeah, that's, it's really important. And again, it's tied to seafood quality too as well, right? So it's going to affect your business um, if you don't follow the seafood safety rules and maintain that nice quality that comes with direct marketing. Um, it's, of course, one of those tougher ones because there's a lot of permitting and regulations regarding seafood safety. So it depends on the product, the type of product, and even the type of market that you're involved in. Um, we, in working with and developing our website, we basically, the agencies did not want us saying, okay, here are the steps you go through in order to, you know, make sure you do all the seafood safety things correctly. There's too many nuances and complications. So instead, what we've done um, is just list folks that you need to talk to about your product and your types of markets, and then find out exactly what you need to do. Because it is quite complicated, just like fisheries <laughs> regulations, the seafood marketing side of it <laughs> is also complicated. Um, and so that's that's how, from the extension side of it, that's how we've been handling that. So um, I'm curious if Tom, your experiences have been similar to Carrie's. Uh, well, let's just say that, uh, you know, we, it, we do a whole uh, commercial fishing educational program called Louisiana Fisheries Forward. And on that, uh, and we have a website, louisianafisheriesforward.org. And if you go there, there's a whole library of materials that we've created on best handling practices for seafood, really almost anything you need to be able to, you know, how to handle fish, how to handle crabs, how to handle oysters, it's all there. And we also have a seafood process, I mean, a seafood uh, a quality demonstration lab that's a mobile freezer unit that we, tra we drag around the state to all the dock days and commercial fishermen's meetings and, and meetings that we have, and we teach people proper handling practices. So that's a big part of what we do, and we have a very robust outreach program among the commercial fishermen uh, in our Sea Grant program. So um, I want to throw a couple questions out here, and I'd like to start with uh, our commercial participants, Amber and Matt, first. But if they could tell us what's different about a direct marketing or a, uh, a consumer that wants to buy product uh, through these channels versus someone who goes to Red Lobster and orders an entree. I mean, if you had to describe the difference, and this is something I would, I would ask to the other panelists as well, to all of you, really. So maybe starting with Matt, uh, um, and we'll just go down the list here. Um, do you see a difference in that clientele versus the more commodity-driven? Yeah, I mean, we, we've we've been able to capture the the clientele that that care. Uh, we've we've had people put on our Facebook that the haddock's too expensive or the salmon's too expensive, and they can go buy that at the local grocery store. And, uh, you know, we invite them to. Um, but I think with the messaging and, and the quality that we're, that we're offering, we just seem to be landing in the laps of people that, that care and don't mind paying a little bit extra for, for higher quality. Good, good. Yeah. I would, good. I, I would, I, I agree with, I agree with it, uh, Matt, uh, is that the, the people that are, especially the, the packaged seafood that we're working with, the target always there was for that uh, 
for the Cajun gourmet, I guess you'd call it, people that are looking for the best of the best without additives and those kinds of things. And that's a, and that's a kind of a specialty market. And, and but even the prices that are on the website there for those products, uh, you get around uh, you know, 18 to $20 a pound for top end seafood. Those are national prices. And sometimes it's even more for that, more than that for, uh, for a grouper, snapper, those kinds of things. But that's the market that we're after. This is not uh, people that are looking for uh, big box seafood packs. Carrie, has that been your experience of, of hearing? Yes, definitely. I mean, it comes down to what folks can afford, right? But it costs a certain amount to be able to provide the fish. So it's, um, yeah, you're definitely targeting certain uh, markets based on what types of products, again, you can provide. So Carrie, while I have you on the screen, I want to ask an extension of this question. And that is on the flip side, you advise in your program, as does ours, existing and prospective participants in direct marketing. Um, how do you advise them about how they go about uh, looking at their cost and returns? Because there is a tendency uh, sometimes for people to maybe not run the numbers very carefully on any enterprise. And I would assume there are some break even costs that are higher than dumping a big boatload of seafood on a dock somewhere in the commodity market. Um, how, if, if at all, do you guys advise them to look at their cost structure to make sure this is something that fits them or maybe doesn't? Yeah, that's a great question because you're right. A lot of people don't think about that. <laughs> you know, it's like my time, I don't count it. It's, you know, I don't have to figure that out into the costs. And even in talking to folks around the nation about all this, you know, it often came down to, it wasn't so much the profit that they, obviously it's important, but it wasn't just about that. Again, it was the connections. So there was this value that wasn't just dollars, right? It was actually also this, this additional value that they were getting out of that whole direct marketing experience. Um, so I still, even with the cost and returns, um, you know, FishBiz that Alaska Sea Grants put out, there's a couple of different Sea Grant programs have put out some other things that are great tools for going through that process. Um, but it is also important to realize that there's other values that people get out of it as well. So I wasn't waving you off. I was just waving back to Amber. She, she got knocked off and came back. So uh, thank you, Carrie. Amber, while you were gone, we were touching on a couple of things. And um, one of the questions was, what is your, perception of the average person who wants to buy direct? How are they different from the, the general public? And, and that led to a discussion about price premiums and the reality that price premiums or at least some marginal increase uh, is required given the additional cost of just selling a commodity on the dock. So any of those that you'd like to weigh in on, Amber, now that you're back with us, just turn your mic on and uh, there you go. So I don't apologize for my price. Um, in fact, the other fish markets here in Michigan always make fun of me and they're like, well, Amber is the only one making money. Ha ha ha. Um, but the truth is, is that I have expenses and what I do costs money. And if we can't afford to make a living and pay for our building, then we can't provide a service. And that's all there is to it. Um, I do think that you tend to attract customers when you're doing direct sales. They're a little bit more invested in their health. Um, they really, really care about knowing what's in that product and that they're getting the best they can. Um, a lot of times they have more disposable income, not always. Um, here in Michigan, I do accept our um, food assistance program card and I always make sure that I have products in store that are within that budget type. Um, but for the most part, yeah, I mean, I offer a premium meal prep service that we call Lake to Bakes, which is where every Friday and Saturday we have a prepared, you know, fish dish that's ready for people to take home and just stick in the oven or put on the grill. Um, you know, and that's not something we can do at, you know, a Walmart pricing. It does cost more. Um, but in turn, we also are very transparent about our ingredient sourcing and we try to keep it, you know, with the trend of what's going on in foods and things like that. So 
but yeah, I just, I, I can't apologize. I used to feel like maybe I should be apologizing, but I had to stop doing that because we weren't going to have a business anymore. Right. No. Good point. Excellent. Um, we are coming up on an hour, but I want to uh, ask one more sort of uh, general question that really speaks to the purpose of this session. And that is, and I'd like to start uh, with you, Amber and Matt, you know, what do you need from Sea Grant Extension, if anything, maybe it's nothing, uh, but also to Carrie and Tom, you know, how do we help each other provide information and, and first steps to help people get started and to know where the realities are and the opportunities? Uh, are there informational needs you guys need from the private sector? Are there things that our other panelists could recommend to prospective programs? So, um, Amber, anything that, um, again, I'm putting you on the spot and maybe that you're, you, yeah. you're, you're fine and, and don't require that. But. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm actually really fortunate. We work a lot with our Michigan Sea Grant here in Michigan. Um, they have always been phenomenal to commercial fishing. Um, we had an a commercial fishing extension educator that was in that position for about 500 years. Uh, he's recently passed on the torch to Dr. J and, and she's just phenomenal and she's really been working with us. And I think the most important thing you can do as Sea Grant extension educators is ask your fishermen what they need. Like actually go down to that dock and know that you might be talking to some people who are suspicious of you and they're a little bit maybe standoffish. That's just the nature of commercial fishermen, a lot of them. But but to really ask and say, what is it you need? Um, and keep in mind too, that you probably speak a very different language than what they do when, you know, when Lauren came to me and she's like, hey, what do you guys need for a research? You know, what kind of, what can we do to help you for research study programs, you know? and all the commercial fishermen, their eyes glazed over and they're like, uh, and I'm like, oh, we need an economic impact study, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, make sure you're finding someone that you can connect with that gets where you're coming from and what you can do. Um, and this is just my last thing, but the number one thing that Sea Grant did for us this year during COVID was they got together a panel to do a Zoom discussion with us of our regulators, which is the Department of Agriculture here in Michigan, and let us have at them about what they're looking at for COVID and to really answer a lot of those questions and to take away some of our anxiety that we were having about what additional things were we going to have to be doing, if any, during our inspections. Um, you know, and that was something that Lauren just called and asked us about and said, hey, what do you guys need? So, Excellent. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, Matt, anything that you want to weigh in on in, in regards to that topic area, th things that maybe the state could do or the university can do through their Sea Grant programs that would be of assistance to you or have been perhaps? Not that I can think of, Rex. Okay, then I'm going to go to Carrie and Tom and ask them the same question, but I also want to uh, ask them to provide advice to programs that may be interested in this because we have 33 active programs. Uh, maybe it's more than that. And only a few of them have actually delved into this. So um, if I were an agent or a specialist at a, a coastal program and was interested in getting into this, Carrie, Tom, what would you recommend that we start doing um, and maybe not do as well? Well, uh, so I might I might say we're, we're welcome to share share our experiences with you, talk to you, call us, text us, write us. Uh, please look at what we've created, our materials uh, that are on the Louisiana uh, Direct uh, Louisiana Direct Seafood uh, website, also on the Louisiana Fisheries Forward website. Look at our uh, look at look at what we do. Look at how we've got it set up, laid out. This this is an evolution uh, over over a decade of things that we've learned just by doing. So we really didn't have a model to follow. So we uh, we did it, and it's been it's been a a, a a great success. Sometimes too much of a success. So. Uh, but, but we're, we're here to share what we've learned, and, and uh, if we can help you directly, feel free to reach out to us. So uh, I want to, in case those that are still on the call, we still have about 70 people uh, who might be thinking, what do you mean by too much of a success? Point out that 
uh, Tom and myself and others had to put together a document last week called Beyond Direct Marketing, just to show that we're doing all kinds of other things as well, because we've been so successful in this one area, the perception uh, is sometimes, although it's a misperception, that that's all we're doing. Um, so I think the message there is if you're a Sea Grant program, uh, you obviously want to avoid this idea that, hey, those programs are cutting out the middleman. That's not what we're doing. We're servicing the whole supply chain as well. But also this is one part of it. So Exactly. Uh, but the but the the but the response in our industry is that uh, this is just driving innovation. Like I said, it's a, it's an incubator for all the good things that you want to see happen and 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 to be able to filter this information down from the university and bring it across the whole coast is huge. And so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to do and there's endless ways that you can address it. Carrie, anything you'd like to add on that as far as guidance to a program looking into this to maybe do more? Yes, sir. Um, I think Amber hit it actually first is a needs assessment. You know, that's something we're looking at doing here in California. We talked to lots of folks, we've heard some of the stories, you know, but we're also not reaching the people in some cases that haven't had those successes. So I think it's really important to get out there and talk with folks, you know, throughout the seafood supply chain, fishermen, aquacultures, handlers, everybody, to find out what the needs are. And then we can come together as a network and develop and utilize a lot of the tools that are already out there. So I think that's really critical. Um, also, just thinking about what's going to happen after COVID. So, you know, we can develop and think about ideas for things to do right now, but what can we do now that's going to be useful in the future? So, for instance, the flash freezing and product, you know, different product development has really interested me because I see a need for that now, because as everyone said, not everybody wants to handle live seafood. So there could be these other products, but it could also be helpful in the future because for us in California, we've had a lot of issues with biotoxins and there may be ways to process some of those products that are affected by that through these methods that are useful during COVID, but they could also be very useful to handle those kinds of challenges. So I think it's a multi-step process like most, <laughs> um, but yeah, this is, this is a great step, just talking about things and hearing from all different. Um, well, folks. on that note, um, Amber put in the, the chat and, and maybe this is a good time to kind of ask everybody for their sort of closing thoughts. And, Related to what you just said, Amber, I think is saying maybe we should talk about having some sort of a monthly or a, a, a Zoom call at regular intervals. So um, Amber, Matt, Carrie, Tom, anyone want to make any final suggestions or comments before we wrap up? Well, I would, I would say this is that uh, we think that we're just scratching the surface on the, on the economic development business act opportunities that exist in seafood. We've been a primarily a, a raw protein commodity state forever. And I think that the real innovations that are happening in this industry are happening at this microprocessing level. And there's so much that we haven't even touched on, methods of packaging, et cetera, uh, uh, modified atmospheres, skin packs, all those kinds of things that can help bring even our commodity industry uh, into, into a new place going forward. So uh, I, think, I think we're just beginning to touch this. Excellent. Amber? Um, I'd just like to say that the most helpful thing I ever had when we were starting out was we went to um, North Carolina with North Carolina Sea Grant when they hosted the local catch summit there and we did one of their coastal tours and they took us around and Sarah from, from Sea Grant there took us around and brought us to the fishing communities. And that was so incredibly helpful to be able to talk to other people and see what they're doing and really have that hands-on experience. And um, even people who didn't really, I mean, I don't know anything about shellfish, but still one of the, some of the things they were doing is super, super helpful. So um, those kind of connections really do help people a lot. Well, who knows? Maybe that'll be a, an offshoot of these discussions. Um, we I'm all about Louisiana. Yeah, yeah. We'll have to do Come an exchange, down. We'll do an exchange program. Mm -hmm. um, any other comments? I don't want to to end it prematurely. We have a little more time. If anybody has any comments uh, before we do, going once, uh, I want to say thank you very much to Dave Hansen for his leadership in the Sea Grant Extension Assembly, 
and the subcommittee that puts this together. I want to say a special thanks to Amber, Matt, Kerry, and Tom, our panelists, and to all of you who registered as attendees. It's very interesting, and I think will lead to more uh, networking and exchange. Thank you all for participating. <laughs>